Okay, now we now uh, arrive at the vexed and troubled question of money. <clears throat> um, money is, first of all, money is the the most controversial aspect of economics inside the Austrian movement, outside the Austrian movement, and in the general public uh, at large. Uh, mon- there's an enormous number of people, for example, most of the general public do not take particular stands on, on uh, interest rates or uh, whatever, the banana industry and things like that. <clears throat> when it gets to money, there are all sorts of, uh, how should we put it, um, self-taught monetary theorists <laughs> all over the place. And uh, most of us, I think, at least I do, I get about several missives a year from unknown people, a big packet, and uh, inside the packet there's a letter, uh, School, usually often in red crayon, which is a tip, <laughs> sort of a cultural tip off. <laughs> and uh, and enclosed, dear Dr. Rothbard, I have my like, this great treatise on money, which I hereby enclose for your benefit, for your benefit, of like you know, 80 pages of comments within 24 hours. And uh, it's a treatise on money with graphs and arrows and all sorts of stuff. Um, if, you, if, you, if I wanted to take time off, I could spend my entire life doing critiques of this stuff. Usually, of course, I don't. And, uh, but basically, the bottom line in all this is the way to success, happiness, prosperity, world peace is to print an unlimited amounts of money. That's, that's the, that's the uh, upshot. So <clears throat> we have these. These used to be known as monetary cranks in uh, the 19th century. And uh, <clears throat> they're considered a little baffy and so forth and so on. Unfortunately, what's happened since the Keynesian era uh, so the monetary cranks have taken over the asylum and are now controlled. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, there's, there are subdivisions, of course. The the uh, the self-taught monetary cranks are not do not have the accepted jargon. They've created their own jargon, which is always difficult uh, to get across uh, very quickly. At any rate, <clears throat> the one of the difficulties about money is that the um, it contains and by the way, and money is another issue. Even within the libertarian movement, um, which which Walter clarified this afternoon is what the differences are from the Austrian movement. Within the libertarian movement, uh, Leonard Reed, for example, who was the president of the Foundation for Economic Education, which for many years was the only libertarian organization in the country, never published anything on money because he said he couldn't understand any. There were eight or ten different theories. He couldn't understand any of them. Therefore, he didn't publish it. Any, anything on money. So money is a, is a controversial question within the libertarian movement. It's, it's a controversial question within the Austrian movement, even more controversial than monopoly theory. <clears throat> okay, the, uh, one, of the, one of the problems with money is it's, it's the only uh, part of production I can think of, the only commodity where historical history becomes extremely important. In other words, if we're dealing with a banana industry or the coal industry, we don't have to deal with the history. It's, it's important, it's interesting, it's important, but we can analyze the economics of coal without going to the, how coal originated. You can't do that with money. Money has an historical component in it, in the value of it. And so uh, it's impossible to understand the nature of money without going to the origin of it. <clears throat> and it's also impossible to understand, to evaluate public policy and how, where to go from here without understanding the essence and, the, and therefore the origin of it. So I'm going to start with the origin. <clears throat> um, actually, some of, the, some of the scholastics, John Buridan was the first great monetary theorist, and um, arrived more or less at the Austrian theory of the origin of money. Uh, and uh, it, it was sort of a tradition, scholastic tradition. And uh, Karl Menger, in his famous uh, article on the origin of money, and which is included in the principles text, goes through the uh, a magnificently praxeological pattern of how money originated. Uh, starts in barter. Well, you, you start you start with direct exchange with uh, two goods, let's say, which are both beneficial. You have to have a Friday Crusoe model, let's say, where one person is hunting fish and the other one is uh, uh, hunting meat, and they exchange fish for meat at a certain whatever agreed upon a bargaining price. And you get, a, you get direct commodities there uh, being used. You have little, you, know, you wind up with a teeny village with, uh, with somebody as a shoemaker, somebody else as an egg producer, and some, et cetera, et cetera. And you get to the point where barter, very, very early to the point where barter becomes not only inefficient, but almost impossible to get out of. In other words, you come up against an iron wall. <clears throat> One example I like to use in classes is uh, 
if I if I take a break, you know, from my morning class to the afternoon class and go want to get a, go out and get a sandwich, it'd be very difficult to find a restaurant owner who would accept 10 minutes of economics lecture for the rest of the for the sandwich. <laughs> very difficult. Matter of fact, I think I'll probably starve. <laughs> so, so they want they want something which is they don't not interested in learning about economics, at least from me. And so, uh, <laughs> as the problem was known technically as the double coincidence of wants. And this, these, these issues, by the way, were the form of chapter one of every money and banking text until about 1933. It's, it's now dropped out of, it's a loss of knowledge. Uh, now we start off with the, I remember one, I remember the first, the, one of the first examples of this, the Chamber of Commerce had a money t uh, textbook on economics, and they had a money chapter. And started off, sentence number one, I remember it burned with crystal clarity in my, in my head, was money is whatever the government says it is. That's it. And then they continue on. <clears throat> so uh, we have a loss, a definite loss of knowledge here. <laughs> At any rate, the, um, we start, so we start off with barter. We start off with the problem of double coincidence of wants. Uh, another example I use in class is somebody produces eggs and he wants to buy shoes you know, in exchange for the eggs. But he finds out that the shoemaker, the only one in town, is allergic to eggs. As the doctor told him he breaks out of migraines every time he eats eggs. So what's he going to do? He wants to get shoes. He's the only one shoemaker. So they have all these problems of coincidence of wants, and you have a problem of indivisibilities. So if you own a house and the barter system, you want to sell it, what do you do? Uh, you want to exchange the house for a whole bunch of things, a, a car, a, a bale of wheat or whatever. What do you do? Do you chop up the house into 50 different parts and sell one fiftieth, you know, one fiftieth for a car, another fiftieth for, for food, for frozen food or whatever? You obviously can't do that. When you chop up a house, you lose the entire value. You can't get one fiftieth and exchange it. So that's that's the problem of indivisibility and the problem of double coincidence of wants. So between the two of them, you're stuck. You can't, of course, you can't calculate any kind of complex manner either. Uh, but even before you get to the calculation problem, you get to the problem: how do you get this stuff? How do you find a, a shoemaker is not allergic? So, so very, very quickly, the market begins to solve it. And it's not solved by social contract or by the government, by expert commissions being established, bipartisan commission being established to figure out what to do about this. Uh, individuals begin to find out, for example, the, uh, the uh, egg, egg producer who faces the problem of the, of the shoemaker is allergic to eggs. He finds, what, 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 what does he want? What would he like instead of eggs? Well, he likes... Uh, uh, cheese, let's say. So the egg guy goes to a cheese person, exchanges his eggs for the other guy's cheese, then takes the cheese and re-exchanges it for the shoes. Or, or takes wood or something like that. In other words, he finds another commodity. After all, the, the shoemaker, even though he's allergic to eggs, would like to buy something. He's, he's engaged in some kind of barter arrangement. He finds out what the shoemaker wants and he gets it and then re-exchanges it. In this first, this is the beginning of, of uh, indirect exchange. In other words, he finds out the, the best way to to settle his wants in this case is a bumbleworking roundabout process. He's got to find something else. He can't get the guy to accept eggs or find some, buy something else or buy cheese or bale of a cord of wood or something like that and exchange that for shoes. <clears throat> um, as this begins to happen, we begin to surmount the problem of double coincidence wants. I find out what the new stand, what does the restaurant, what does the restaurant owner want if he doesn't want economic lectures? Well, he maybe he likes, I don't know, uh, uh, cords of wood. So I get logs of wood and exchange it. So you begin to surmount the problem by finding commodities which can be used not just for monet for direct use, but also for indirect uh, exchange purposes, for medium of exchange purposes. And very quickly, when this begins to be done, it starts to be a spiral upward because every when something is known, if you go through I mean, Walter used the term Duckburg, Duckburg, Ohio, or something. You find out that in Duckburg, uh, cords of wood are being used for exchange purposes. Then you start using it. Oh, this, uh, you know, the cord of wood can buy anything you want in Duckburg, Ohio. So different regions, different societies begin to develop common media of exchange. And very quickly, one or two commodities went out in the race of which should be the, the, the medium of exchange. <clears throat> and the ones that went out, went out, and over, over history, Literally hundreds, hundreds of commodities have been selected by the market for this purpose. They all have certain characteristics. We can't say definitely one will be chosen, but there are certain characteristics which would mark uh, a, a, market, a monetary, of course, this is money, general use of medium exchange is money, uh, which make a commodity a moneyish, uh, good bet for a moneyish commodity in case the, if the occasion arises. Uh, it has to be easily recognizable in general, since somebody knows what it is, 
If you have a blank box, which nobody knows what's in it, it's not going to be used as money because nobody, nobody will accept it. What the hell is that? So that's, that's not a good candidate. Um, easily recognizable and general demand as a useful commodity for one reason or another. Okay. General demand. Highly, therefore, highly marketable. Everybody knows it and they, they like it. Uh, and a commodity of high value per unit weight, if you can carry the darn thing around. Uh, it's be difficult to have, say, a stone pillar as money because you, what do you do with it? <laughs> so you, so the, you have these uh, qualities which are then, uh, you know, then pinpointed, uh, recognizable, portable, high value per unit weight. The high value per, per unit weight really accomplishes a lot of this because it has a high value. It's a high value per unit weight. It means you can carry it around. Uh, divisible, something which can be divided quickly and not lose its value. And butter, for example, is highly divisible. It's great. You can slice butter into it, right? But butter has other problems. It's, you can, it sort of melts. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, and durable. It should last you know, more than 10 minutes. So uh, fish before refrigeration is a toughie. Uh, although they did, the fish was used, codfish was used in the New England colonies as money, uh, but it had difficulties. So you have... These begin to be used as money. Once they're used as money, once they're used as a general medium of exchange in a society, enormous further benefits flow. Uh, economic, well, economic calculation takes place. For example, if you're a business firm under barter, it's be difficult to conceive of it. If you're a firm under barter, you're trying to figure out at the end of the month, at the end of the year, whether you made quote unquote money or, or lost it. Uh, well, let's see, we took in last month 2,000 yards of string, uh, 30 baseball cards, <laughs> two hats, <laughs> four pounds of rice, etc. I mean, we paid out you know, 20 pounds of rope or whatever, you know, totally heterogeneous, you can't figure out what's going on, whether you're losing, gaining, nobody knows nothing, right? Uh, and similarly, on prices, under barter, the price is almost an infinite number of prices. In other words, what's the price of that hat? Well, the price of the hat, it's two thirds of a string, it's three, three baseball cards, it's one eighteenth of a cow, and that sort of thing, go on and on. There's no common denominator of prices, there's no calculation, it's all chaotic. So with the, with the arrival of some commodities, money, suddenly we magically solve these problems. Uh, you find out, not only do you don't have to worry about, I don't have to worry anymore about finding a restaurant owner who wants the 10 minute economics lecture. I can just get money from my college and buy stuff with money. Uh, and the same way with, with everything, everybody else, the price doesn't, I can figure out the price very easily. The price of this, whatever, this picture is $3. It's not one fifth of a hat. So everything has a money price and price in terms of money, and uh, everything is reckoned in terms of money. So the business firm now, when, looks, when the business firm looks over the past month, they don't have to worry about how many balls of string they've got and what, what value they put on it. You say, well, we took in uh, 100 gold ounces last month. We paid out 98 gold ounces. We're in fairly good shape. We have a profit of two gold ounces. So economic calculation becomes possible, and reckoning becomes possible, and price, uh, prices in terms of one unit. <clears throat> Um, during, uh, there's a marvelous article, which I'm sure you've read because it's been in every, every anthology of economic readings for the last 40 years. It's still a great article by uh, R.A. Radford called Economic Organization of a POW Camp. And uh, Radford was a British officer who got, went to, got arrested by the Germans early in World War II, about 1939. He was in the camp for about five years. And of course, it was a very large camp, and he observed the economics uh, of it. And one of the things that happened was very quickly in the camp, first he had exchanges. Everybody, production is simply rationing from outside, you know, care packages or whatever. Uh, production comes in on the first of each month or whatever. And then people start exchanging it because I get a can of anchovies. I don't like anchovies. I exchange it for somebody else's peaches who doesn't like peaches. Very quickly, you begin to get a market. And very quickly after that, money developed. Uh, a commodity was used which is in great demand, easily recognizable, beloved by people, have a high value per unit weight, portable, not durable, unfortunately, but there was no gold available, and that, and that, namely cigarettes. Cigarettes became money. Everything became reckoned in terms of cigarettes. Uh, so what's the price of that can of peaches, three cigarettes? What's the price of this uh, whatever, uh, under bread, half a cigarette, et cetera, et cetera. So everything got reckoned in cigarettes, and the British officer was assigned the task of every day, putting on the bulletin board or the blackboard, what the prices of each item was for that day. Anyway, the story is that the, first of all, it illustrates how money develops out of a useful non-monetary uh, commodity. And so one, one of the interesting aspects of this is toward the end of the war, 
more cigarettes came flooding in because the, the, the people overseas were sending, uh, altruistically sending more cigarettes to the camp. And this screwed up the economy of the camp because price inflation then developed. They, <laughs> they started belly aching about inflation. <laughs> I said, the just price of peaches is two, can it's two cigarettes, and now it's four cigarettes. It's evil. <laughs> and, and they called upon the British officer. I kid you not, this is really what happened. Uh, the, the, uh, the British officers called on the, on the camp directors to enforce price control because the, this evil inflation, inflation is caused by speculators and you know, aliens, whoever, <laughs> and unions and monopolists, whatever. <laughs> Gougers, all the rest of it. So uh, they, they, the British officers imposed price control. And of course, the same thing, usually, the usual thing that happens with any price control, there was a shortage developed. They couldn't find the peaches, couldn't find the anchovies. Black markets developed secret dealings, underhanded dealings, and all sort of stuff. Weakening of quality, poisoning of the peach, whatever. <laughs> so they finally said it doesn't work, and they repealed the price control, and that was the end of it. So it's a marvelous microcosm of, of the economy. Anyway, right. so we have um, what uh, this was. So this is the origin. This is how money originated, and what and this is how it was always originated. And by the way, when the when the commodity is exchanged, the unit, the currency unit, becomes the unit of weight of, com of the commodity, whatever the commodity is exchanging at. Usually, it's in the case of cigarettes, it was number because of a certain you know, definite length. In the case of most commodities, weight is the is the un basic unit. Uh, sugar was used to be a, was a money uh, in. Uh, in Louisiana, and later became Louisiana, that was pounds of sugar. Tobacco was money in Maryland and Virginia, and that became the unit of money was hogsheads of tobacco or pounds of tobacco. So this people reckon they said, What was your income last year, Zeke? My income was twelve hogsheads of tobacco. That's pretty good. Okay. So uh, and what happens, of course, whenever it so happens that uh, there are two commodities which was always have always outcompeted everything else if they have a chance, if the society knows about it. Uh, two commodities which always are better monies from the point of view of the market and, and media of exchange than, than cigarettes even and sugar and salt and tobacco, all of which have been used. <clears throat> Those are gold and silver. Uh, both gold and silver are divisible. They're highly recognizable. They're high, unit per unit, high value per unit weight. There's, you can't find much of them. It's very costly to dig them out of the ground. You can't produce them en masse. Uh, they're durable. They last forever with a little bit of alloy in it. <clears throat> so... Um, they have all the they have all the qualities, and the, but much better than any other commodities. Uh, usually, you know, I don't want to get into the silver question now, because that could, that could take a whole lecture. It's really not worth it. But the silver question messed everything up for hundreds of years when they're trying to figure out the correct money position. Uh, basically, gold is much less abundant than silver, and now it's generally better. It's less it's less apt to get you find big gold gold hoards anymore than or silver hoards. But at any rate. Both gold and silver, usually since silver was much more abundant, that was used for smaller uh, uh, exchanges, and gold was used for larger exchanges. <clears throat> uh, so what happens is that the units, the currency units, the reckoning, instead of hogsheads of tobacco or whatever, were, were, became units of weight of gold or silver. All the, current, all the coins we know about from ancient Persia on were units of weight in their, in their particular language of gold, of gold and silver. The shekel was a certain weight of, of silver or gold, or whatever. Sometimes copper, and, and, and very in minor cases. Uh, so this is the this is how money gets developed. <clears throat> and um, what Mises contributed, in Mises' magnificent book *Theory of Money and Credit*, which is still the best single work written on money. <clears throat> and uh, in 1912, what he did was the set. Well, one of the things he integrated. Money, monetary theory into micro theory, which had never really been done before. I'll get to that in a minute. But basically, what he did is he showed that the Menger analysis of the history of money was the only way money could have developed. It was not only this, the way every money has always been developed out of useful commodities and barter, it's the only way it could have developed. In other words, he showed that the history was necessary, to use the answer's term. <clears throat> um, why is that? You have to, have to get a little, a little bit technical, but I think it's worth it. Uh, basically, the uh, Mises uh, ran the whole Austrian movement, uh, Austrian school ran up against. They developed margin utility and all the things we've heard about. Um, and uh, when Menger and Bombavec, Mises was a member of Bombavec seminar, graduate seminar, postgraduate seminar, I should say. And um, they ran up against the problem in the field of money. You can understand how people can arrive at a direct utilities of. Uh, 
uh, computers or uh, Wonder Bread or whatever. You know what they are and you evaluate them. The consumer evaluates them. Uh, you don't have to know the history of Wonder Bread or the history of computers to evaluate the current product. But in the case of money, uh, after money, after gold, let's say, became used as a money, there was an extra dimension of value to it. In other words, first it was a demand for gold for its own sake. And then added to it is the demand for gold for money, which is much largest part quantitatively of the demand. So uh, if you have a money commodity, um, the demand for money is based not on, the, not on the money itself, not on the fact that it's gold, et cetera. It's based on the fact that previously it had a purchasing power and an exchange value because it's based on the fact that other people have used it. You know darn well if you get gold, you'll be able to exchange it for anything you want. So in other words, Whereas you, you use houses and computers and all the rest of it for its own sake. <clears throat> you only use money because you know it has an exchange value. You know other, everybody else has previously bought it and held on to it. So you have a temporal historical element embedded in the value itself. So the, um, the position the Austrians took was we can't explain uh, the man for money on the basis of margin utility because it's a pre-existing, uh, we can't say that you can't say that the demand for money is caused by its utility because the utility is based on its previous existence as money. So we're stuck. It was called the problem of the Austrian circle. Now, the way the current neoclassical economists saw, quote, saw the problem, they say, they, say, they say it's a phony problem. This is the way Stiegler and Samuelson, et cetera, Patinkin approach it. It's a phony, phony problem. You don't have to worry about it. There's no such thing because there's no such thing as cause. Uh, the Austrians say the utility, subjective utility of consumers cause value, but we know there's no such thing as cause. There's only mutual mathematical functions. And since everything determines everything else, you don't have to worry about causes. There's, everything is a circle. What do you worry about the circle of money for? The whole world is a circle, so to speak. So uh, this, I first the Austrians believe, is a phony solution to the problem. <clears throat> uh, in, in mathematics, I would say in natural sciences, although I'll make a slight amendment to that <clears throat> in a minute, in mathematics, if uh, if x is a function of y, by definition, y is this, another kind of function of x. So everything is a function of everything else. <clears throat> and um, this is not what, uh, what Austrians are interested in. They're interested in causal relations, real causal relations. Uh, now, Carl Menger Jr., uh, who's a math, famous mathematician, um, wrote a, an excellent article. I think it's in the Weber Hicks uh, book on uh, marginal. It's either the it's one of the two books on, on marginal economics now. I forget now which. It's either the Weber Hicks one or the good one. At any rate, he wrote him on uh, uh, mathematical e mathematics and Austrian economics. And being a mathematician, of course, his words carried even more weight than mine would or anybody else's around here, at least the non-mathematicians. And one of the things he said was that even in physics, it's not really true that everything is causelessly functional. And in many cases, uh, when phys phys physicists explain phenomena, say thunder, it's not, it's not a mutual ma mathematical function, it's real causes at work. So even, in, even in, in, in physical sciences, this is kind of weak, sort of like the popper explanation of the, of, of the philosophy of science. <clears throat> um, Menger, by the way, I mean, Carl Menger Jr. said another interesting thing. He said about literature versus mathematics, I'll slip this in as a tangential point. He said, most people think, what he did first is explains the demand curve in, in words. On the, you know, uh, when the price falls, the quantity of purchase will increase and so forth. And he puts, puts it into a mathematical formula, D equal F of X or whatever, F of P or whatever. And he says, most people think that the latter, the mathematical uh, concept is more precise. It's a more precise and elegant, uh, more general explanation of demand than literary way. He said, on the contrary, it's, le it's less precise and less elegant because it leaves out uh, all the prices which are not, all the demand curves which are not, you know, uh, integrable and not, uh, not smoothly arcing and all the rest of it. And so it leaves out all those classes of stuff which the literary explanation includes. So, uh, <clears throat> okay, so what you have in the, so Mises then worried about the problem of the Austrian circle and, and figured out how to solve it. And it was through this, it was this analysis that he arrived at this so-called reg regression theorem, which does not mean uh, calcul uh, does not mean correlation coefficients. Uh, what it means is regressing logically back in time. Essentially, introduce time into the into the picture. So what he basically said, I'm going to put this my own little diagram here. Uh, 
Uh, this is the if, this is today. This is D N. And uh, okay, this is a supply. Of, this is the demand for money. And this is supply of money down here. Supply M, which is usually called capital M, of course. And then these two uh, impinge on and determine today's purchasing power of money. I'll get to that a little bit later, what exactly this means. It's essentially the value of the purchasing power of money. Okay, so this is, okay, this is today, for today, then the supply of money today and the demand for money today determine the purchasing power of money today or the value of the price. This is true of every product, the, you know, the demand for peaches, uh, interacting with supply of peaches will cause, will determine the price of peaches today. However, the demand for money today has a, has a historical element in it, namely the fact that money existed, this gold or whatever, existed as money yesterday. Today is a logical term now, that's just a time period. It's, it's a logical time period. Could be last month. <laughs> okay, so day n minus one. So the fact that there was a purchasing power yesterday influences is a necessary condition for the existence of DM today. We have, so the purchasing power of money yesterday, of course, was determined by demand for money yesterday and the supply of money yesterday. So in other words, part of the, ex the breaking out of the Austrian circle, so to speak, is to say, look, there's a temporal element here. And it's true that the, man for the existence of demand for money today is dependent on uh, a, a pre-existing price, but the pre-existing price of money was yesterday's price, so you're pushing it back. Well, then the critics will say, well, okay, that's all right, but, the, but it's an infinite regress. It still doesn't, you don't, you don't conclude the explanation of determining today's money supply, you're just pushing back uh, the, the time infinitely. But, you don't, but Mises' answer to that was, you're not pushing it back infinitely, you're pushing it back to the time when barter, when the, when the gold or whatever was a useful commodity in barter. You're pushing it back before indirect exchange took place. In other words, as you keep going back here, you get back to say B1, the first day of when the commodity was used as a medium of exchange. Um, same thing applies, you have these arrows coming back. And uh, this is dot, dot, dot from DN minus one to hundreds of years back. And, uh, and finally you get, this is D0, the last day of barter, so to speak, the last day when gold or silver or whatever was used purely as a, as a non-monetary commodity. And after that, wait a minute, let's push this one step rightward here. The last day of barter was the last time it was influenced and with here we have a situation, gold had been used until zero as just pure barter, not as money at all. At that point, so it had a pre-existing barter price like all the other barter commodities uh, did. And then, and then they start using, people start using it as medium of exchange, and then the arrows start. But before this point, the zero minus one, so to speak, there's no arrow at all, just the individual Commodities as we usually think of them. In other words, supply of gold, demand for gold, determine the purchasing power of gold, the price of gold. And then when we start being used as money, the, era, the, the historical influence begins. So in other words, we logically regress the explanation of today's price of money or demand for money back to the first day of barter. Back to the, the last day of barter, which is that last day when uh, money begins to be, gold say begins to be used as money. This completes the explanation. It's a brilliant and magnificent uh, tour de force which has never really been absorbed by the profession. The way uh, it hasn't been dealt with by too many people, uh, their arguments that it was an infinite regress were wrong. Patinkin gets it wrong when he tries to crit criticize it. Uh, basically, it still just hasn't been talked, of, uh, talked about. <clears throat> I will deal with that a little bit more when I get to Keynesianism. Some theories get talked about a lot, others don't get talked about at all. It has very little to do with the merit or demerit, in many cases, of the theory. Uh, and. Uh, the, uh, the tragedy of this thing is that the, the regression theorem has not really been fully absorbed, not just by the mainstream of the profession, but by the Austrian economic movement itself. Uh, it's the one area where most Austrian monetary theorists, there are not many of them, but they're there, don't consider it. They just, it's, it's blank out time again. <clears throat> so uh, some of the implications of this, <clears throat> as Mises, of course, points out, is that 
if money has to originate as a useful commodity in barter, it can't originate in any, any other way. It can't originate by social contract. It can't originate by, originate by the government saying, okay, from now on you guys use, you know, whatever, uh, sand as money. It has to originate on the market out of a non-useful commodity. Um, this, of course, eliminates a lot of what's called cons what Hayek calls constructivist uh, plans and schemes. <clears throat> A lot of people out there, it's really pretty amazing, there's a lot of, uh, I hesitate to call them crackpot schemes, but it's the, it's the word that keeps popping, coming to mind. There are a lot of schemes of what should be money. And uh, the um, and people who are against well, Hayek himself is a perfect example of somebody who spends most of his time attacking constructivism and rationalism and all that. But I guess the money, he's got, he's the most constructivist of us all, or at least one of the most. He's got a scheme of introducing a new currency unit called the ducat. Why the ducat? Because there used to be a currency unit back in ancient old Austria or something. Uh, I'm not a numismatist. Let me fill in on that. Uh, and the ducat will be issued by the ducat bank um, or whatever, the Hayek bank, which will issue a ducat. And the uh, ducat will be kept stable in, the form, in terms of some price level or other, and therefore people will flock to the ducat. They'll leave the mark and the franc, and we'll have pe the people's money. We'll have what he calls it denationalized money, private money being issued. Um, my response to this, I'm, I'm in favor of allowing private money. There's a difference between something that something should be legal and, and, and boosting it as being a sort of a solution to the currency of the money problem. I'm in favor of issuing Rothbard tickets. Why not? I'll issue 10 Rothbards, 5 Rothbards, 1 Rothbard, and, and try to spend it. Uh, the heck with lending it out. I'll just spend it. I'll issue tickets, I'll write tickets. Uh, and if somebody, if I want to get a sandwich, I go to the restaurant and I say, I have 100 Rothbards here. Pay for it. If they don't take me away in a, in a loony bin, uh, I might try it in a friendly area like this. We'll never try this in New York, of course. It'd be worth my life. <laughs> so uh, now the, usually the response I get from a friendly audience is, I'll, I'll, I'll accept your ticket, Murray. Well, it's very sweet, but it's not quite enough to establish, <laughs> establish it as money. So issuing, in other words, you have a situation. You issue a new currency unit, whether it's a Ducat or a Hayek or a Rothbard or whatever, Nobody's going to take it. I mean, you should have the freedom to issue it. Why not? The point is, who's going to accept this thing and use it as money? You have to, it has to be rooted. I, I don't want to use the word organic. It has to be rooted in a market phenomenon and a market process which arrives which arise at a currency unit <clears throat> in some sense. Well, if it has to be rooted in the market, how did the government get its, get its phony money across? Well, it got it by, first of all, a long process, long historical. Again, history is important here. A long historical process. The government started with the... With the Linguistic term for weight of unit of weight of gold or silver. The dollar was originally dollar that wasn't invented didn't come out of the sky. It was originally the word for a, an ounce unit of ounce coin of silver issued with a kind of schlick in Bohemia. And they were beautiful coins, and they were, you know, they looked pretty, and they they held they were state they were they didn't erode and that sort of stuff. They were, and it was known as a you got, had good brand names throughout throughout Central Europe. So the dollar was then was called the schlichten dollar, and then abbreviated the dollar. So the dollar was, had, a, had a long, uh, proud name and so forth, had general acceptance, and also acceptance as a unit of weight, in this case of silver. Later on, it became a unit of weight of gold. But the point is, these, every currency unit began as a unit of weight of gold or silver. Then, of course, after the public gets accustomed to hundreds of years of this, and they, they're reckoning as, yes, my income is $20 or whatever, then the government, of course, manipulates and nationalizes the word dollar, gets rid of gold by one way or the other, and then it becomes a fiat unit. But it does, the government doesn't start out with a fiat unit. It starts out with a history of, ex, of accepting this kind of process. And once the, once the arrows are in place, unfortunately, then the, the public wants dollars. They, they, don't, they don't care so much about the gold aspect anymore. They want the, they, they're used to the word dollar, and dollar becomes the currency. And the government takes advantage of this and nationalizes it. There was one monetary theorist, J. Lawrence Lachlan, who had a kind of a sweet theory. I wish it were right. The theory was that once the becomes fiat money, the dollar will lose monetary value, and nobody will accept it. Unfortunately, it didn't work that way. It'd be nice if it could work, but it didn't. So once the thing, once it goes on by its own momentum, once you have the gold established, once you have then the name established, after hundreds of years, the government, the people are then used to it. The Mongolian Empire, for example, tried to, um, and they conquered much of Europe and Asia, they tried to force their own paper money on the public. They wouldn't accept it. They never heard of the, whatever the money was, the Mungo or something. <laughs> They just wouldn't accept it, even, on the, even with a death penalty for not accepting. Even a death penalty does not work in, in, the, mon in the money area. <clears throat> so, but after habituation by hundreds of years, uh, it did work. 
So the Hayek is not going to work as, as charming as it is. I'm not even buying a, Hayek, a ducat myself, but it's not going to be generally acceptable. And the Rothbard is not going to be generally acceptable. And all the rest of it, we, we have to have the dollar back or the franc or the mark, because that's what the public is used to for hundreds of years. <clears throat> it's their monetary unit. <clears throat> so uh, all these schemes for denational, so allegedly denationalizing money never try to denationalize the dollar. We could say everybody should have the right to print dollars, like a ticket saying dollars on it. That, that's kind of weird. Uh, because then, of course, we'd have hyperinflation immediately overnight. I guess it'd be one way to rid the public of their love of dollars, but it's kind of a peculiar way to do it. It's sort of a people's revolutionary way of doing it. <clears throat> so uh, the dollar is now defined, it used to be defined as 1 20th of gold ounce. It's now defined as whatever the Federal Reserve Board prints of the dollar. This is it. It's a ticket with an insignia on it, a seal or whatever. So, <clears throat> um, and another, another problem, uh, sort of an ancillary problem of this, another, in a sense, more lovable than the Hayek deviation is the is, uh, people I know who try to mint private gold coins and have an uh, ounce basis, one ounce coins, and say, this should be the, the money. Everybody should use this as money instead of the evil dollar. Well, it's a charming position. But the public, the point is, again, for hundreds of years now, the public is not used to gold coins. They're used to dollars. They're, used to the, they're not going to use it as money, even though be great if they would. It just ain't going to fly. <clears throat> so what has to be done if you want, if one wants a gold currency, then what we have to do is the denash, get the dollar out of the hands of the government and get the gold out of the hands of the government, tie them together, and get then you can have a people's free market money. I'll get to that a little later, either today or tomorrow. <clears throat> um, so the... Um, <clears throat> Okay, we have now the we have money established. We have the commodity established as money, and it's kind of an interesting thing because the analysis of money is very, in a way, it's like every other commodity. It's, 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 it's a very, it's a beautiful way of illuminating it. It's no different from any other commodity except there's one big difference, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the value of money is determined the same way the value of anything else is determined by the interaction of demand and supply. Uh, another. <laughs> Familiar diagram. We have the. This is the. It's one of the almost the only diagram I count in that's. Uh, Walter was talking about evil di evil and ranking and hated diagram. This is a fairly lovable one. Uh, price on the y-axis, the man falling the man curve, whatever the good is, and this is my addendum or amendment to the usual one: a vertical supply curve. Uh, vertical because this is the stock available at any given time. The orthodox supply curve incorporates within an element of time, which makes it a non-diagram. A non you have, you have, this is an instantaneous, the demand curve is instantaneous and subjective, and the supply curve, the usual sloping, upward sloping supply curve is, has a time dimension in it, so it makes it illegitimate for, for diagrammatic purpose, diagrammatic theory. So we have at any given time a certain stock of the commodity available for sale. And the, inter the intersection, of course, of these two will give you the day-to-day -day market price. Now, money is, the value of money is determined exactly the same way. You have a stock. In the case of money, of course, say gold or even paper dollars, the vertical supply line is even better because you don't have a, a regular su market supply curve going on, even in the long run. So you have a basically exogenous, exogenously determined supply or stock, and people are demanding it. Now, the demand for money is what? Demand for money is falling in the same way as any other demand for, demand for any other good is falling because uh, if uh, one of, well, one, I think the best way to, to explain this is that this is a demand most people think if you ask them just off the cuff, my demand for money is infinite. I accept any money that you give me. But the demand curve is not based on how much you're willing to, to accept. It's based on how much you're willing to shell out. And what are you willing to sacrifice to pay for getting more money? In this case, what are you, how much are you willing to hold on to the money and say instead of spending it? Now, that's not obviously not infinite. It's a balance between spending it on consumer goods, spending it on investment goods, and keeping it, holding on to it, an expectation of future spending. So you have, if, if for example, supposing we had a very high uh, pri price of money, the purchasing power of money which is the same thing as the price of money. By the way, that's a very simple way to explain this is, 
if the price of Wonder Bread is a dollar, it means that the Wonder Bread sell, it means the purchasing power of Wonder Bread on the market is a buck. The seller of Wonder Bread can get a dollar for it. So the price of something is the same thing as its purchasing power. The purchasing power of dollars is the same thing as how much you can buy for it. It's, uh, it's one, one Wonder Bread loaf or two candy bars or one tenth of a hat, et cetera, et cetera. It's an array of goods, you can, alternative goods that you can buy for it. If you had a very high demand for money, if, for example, we're back in the good old days of 1910 price level, where you could buy an eight-course meal for 25 cents and all the rest of them, all the rest of my magnificent things, then you'd only have, you only need, you only want a small amount of money to carry around in your purse or wallet for day-to-day -day expenses or for emergency expenses or whatever, because you're getting, you know, you get a taxi ride for, for 30 cents and that sort of stuff. You only need a couple of, need a couple of dollars. So in other words, if the purchasing power of money is very high, your demand for money to hold is very low. <clears throat> if, on the other hand, you had a very inflationary price situation, the lunch would cost 20 bucks and the Wonder Bread would cost $15, that sort of stuff, you'd have to carry around a lot of money if you, if you had it. But you'd want to carry around a lot of money to get you through the day. And so if you had a low purchasing power of the dollar, you'd have a very high demand for money to hold. So you have a falling demand for money in relationship to its purchasing power <clears throat> as you have for anything else. The, inter the interaction of the demand, fully the demand for money and the, and the vertical supply line gives you at any given time the price, the purchasing power of the money, the so-called price level, in the usual way that you have for any supply and demand. <clears throat> okay, that's, that's the basic similarity. And by the way, R Roger was talking yesterday about different theories of interest. Uh, he didn't talk about the Keynesian theory of interest, which is the other the other aspect, namely, it's determined by demand for money, uh, a liquidity preference. I would simply say here that's a, that's a total falsehood, falsehood. The demand for money is related to the purchasing power of, of, of the dollar. Demand for the dollar is related to the purchasing power. Interest is determined by time preference. You've got two things going on, so to speak, in people's noodles and people's value scales. One is deciding how much to spend on present goods versus how much to spend on future goods. In other words, consumption versus saving dash investment. And the other is how much to hold in your cash balance, which is the first is determined by time preference. The second is determined by the margin utility of money in relation to other goods. It's related to the purchasing power and the expected purchasing power, of, uh, future purchasing power of the dollar. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, of course, you have the problem of the business cycle and the, the, the banks uh, issuing credit, et cetera, and messing up the interest rate. But basically, this is the... These are the, are the causal relationships. <clears throat> um, of course, the Keynesians leave out time preference and then we bring in the, the monetary theory of interest. Uh, by the way, the, the monetary theory of interest, the pre-Keynesian theory is essentially what's wrong with the economics, if anybody's interested in the esoteric topic, the economics of 19th century individualist anarchists like Spooner and Tucker, uh, who believed, who, who were Ricardian, Ricardian Marxists. In other words, they believed that only labor uh, was worth uh, labor is the total sole producer, and only labor should uh, earn income. And the profits, rent, and interest were evil. But they believed if you had free issue of money, if everybody could print their own money tickets, their own dollars, high X, ducats, or whatever, this would drive the rate of interest to zero. There'd be an unlimited supply of money. This, the rate of interest and profits would go down to zero since they didn't have any entrepreneurial theory of profits. And rent would be, you wouldn't, you wouldn't protect landlords at the end of it. <clears throat> so it's sort of, it's sort of like free competitive Marxism. <clears throat> at any rate, the, uh, so you have the, uh, this is the, so in this sense, money acts like any other, other commodity. But there's one other sense, very important sense, which I promised to deal with, where money is not like every other commodity. Namely, uh, well, let's put it this way. And every other commodity the more the better, other things being equal. In other words, if, we, if you have a higher supply of consumer goods, just general total supply of consumer goods, general productivity, we're better off. If you want to use the word society is better off, I realize there are problems with that. Uh, if you find a new oil strike or oil supply, it's, it's a good thing. You're increasing the number of natural resources. If you have more capital goods, it's good because you're increasing the supply of future consumer goods. In other words, you have every other commodity, every other useful commodity, increases production and increases the transformation of nature into consumer goods, and is therefore, quote, good, unquote, increases the standard of living. <clears throat> so the more, the better. There's no such thing as the optimal supply of, of resources. The more, the better. Uh, we have a problem with population theory. I don't want to get into that. But in general, you understand what I mean? There's no such thing as an optimal supply of consumer goods. The more, the better. 
In the case of money, however, it, it isn't true, because the only function money has is to exchange for present and future exchanges. You don't need more. Once there's enough to make it on the market as a, as a money, once there's enough whatever it is, gold or, or cigarettes or whatever, to make it as a money, you don't need any more of it. <clears throat> it doesn't increase any social benefit. Because if you have more of something of exchangeable good, all that happens is that the power of purchasing is diluted. The best what happens is that, the, that you have a 50% dilution of the purchasing power of each dollar, even before prices go up. See, the evil is not the prices go up. The evil is the initial inc increase of the resources, the counterfeiting, if you want to call it that, which means that the counterfeiters can then grab some of the resources which were previously uh, received by producers. <clears throat> so <clears throat> there's no social benefit of increasing the money supply once there's enough to function as money, period. And that's the difference. That's the, uh, that's the thing which distinguishes it. Every, in other words, every supply of money is optimal. There's no need to increase it. And uh, of course, there's all sorts of statements in literature. No, no, you have to increase the money supply with the number of people. What's going to do the number of people? Why should the money supply per capita remain frozen? No, no need for it. All that happens is if you have more exchanges, more production, prices go down. It's magnificent. Uh, the idea of, see, we, we, we're not familiar with the idea of prices falling as a, as a great ideal. All through the 19th century, late 18th and 19th century, prices fell, except during wartime. And of course, the government poured on the money, money supply and prices went up. All the rest of the time, prices fell. It must have been magnificent. They wake up in the morning and realize that 10 years from now, five years from now, next year, prices of the cost of living will fall. You know it in your heart and your gut. Everybody had these magnificent deflationary expectations. They're always right, except in wartime. <clears throat> so... And you didn't have mass bankruptcies because even though price, selling prices fell, costs also fell. What usually happens is the money wage rates remain about the same. The cost of living fell, real wages went up, and, they, and, they, and real increase in real income was diffused throughout the society. It wasn't only achieved, uh, gained by entrepreneurs and, and unions. It was also gained by, say, people on fixed incomes who were or pensioners who would also get the benefits of this increased living standard. <clears throat> So, of course, all this is now it's like talking about the, you know, the antediluvian period, because the idea of prices falling as a regular course of events seems to be absurd. But that's the way it was until, really, that's the way it was until, 19, until World War II, when the whole monetary system uh, was changed. So, <clears throat> the, um, so this means that any infusion of new money is a redistributing device a counterfeiting device instead of, instead of a social benefit. Now, now you might ask the question, how about gold? Is, 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 is the, should gold be frozen? Is, is gold inferior to frozen fiat money? Somebody asked me this last night. It's a very common question. Isn't it better to have the government, sort of benign government, freezing the money supply forever instead of having a gold standard where you're, where you're at the mercy of, of market forces and the gold supply can increase? And well, several answers to that. One is that... Uh, of course, who can trust the government? The whole point is the government is the is an inherently inflationary institution. Uh, I'll get back to that in a second. The second answer which I want to stress right now is that it's true that gold as money is no social benefit, but gold as gold is social benefit. In other words, if you increase the supply of gold, at least you've got more gold for jewelry, for for te filling teeth, and all the rest of it. So you have a you have an increase in non-monetary benefits in the form of price. And this is generally beneficial. But of course, an increase in fiat money and Federal Reserve notes is no benefit whatsoever, no social benefit. It's pure, it's pure counterfeiting. Um, and of course, to get back to the second point, to trust the government to keep the money supply stable is like the like proverbial setting of the fox to guard the hen house, chicken house. I mean, it's just it's absurd. The, uh, what happens is that the uh, government has a legal monopoly on the counterfeiting function. You can put it this Give it an air of uh, uh, pretension. Uh, the the government, if you look at punishment, a libertarian movement, for example, does not have any so solid punishment theory. But it's interesting that the state, invariably, the highest punishments are le levied not on uh, private victims or private crimes like mugging, rape, et cetera, et cetera, or murder. The, the, where the state really gets a person, when they really zero in on you, is two things. One, income tax evasion, and two, counterfeiting. Uh, where the entire mass might of a state, they don't worry about your, what your conditions were as a kid, you were the private playgrounds and all the rest of it. They don't care about any stuff. They, put you, they throw the key away. Because the income tax evader and, and the counterfeiter are hurting directly the major, two major revenue sources of the state apparatus. 
That means uh, theft and counterfeiting. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> taxation being theft and counterfeiting, <laughs> printing and money being counterfeiting. So what you're doing in counterfeiting <laughs> is you're creating paper tickets. In other words, how does it, how do, how do, in a free market, how do people arrive? How do they get money? Most people get money by selling goods and services in exchange for it. A small number of people were gold miners, let's say, who mine, you know, mine the gold out of the ground, and it's costly and they didn't scarce and all that, and they supply it to the market. Uh, these are all producers. They exchange products. They produce something and exchange products. The government, however, prints tickets and then and force drafts, spends money thereby extracting resources from the producers into its own pocket. So counterfeiting is equivalent to theft. Uh, it's another form of government revenue. <clears throat> and so, of course, when the counterfeiters are private, when they're unorganized, and interfere with the state, they're cracked down on very, very sharply. Uh, the, um, I'm not sure I go as far as Walter who claims the counterfeiter is a hero, the private counterfeiter, but still an also an interesting concept. <laughs> He's competing with the state. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, <laughs> so, so what you have then is a, is a, is a problem of, uh, of uh, and, and it's social policy of, of, a, of, a, of a counterfeiting process, one, causing inflation, two, causing theft through extracting resources from increasing money supply, and also by inflating, distorting ca cal economic calculation and all sorts of other things, which are a result of inflation. Uh, one of the things about inflation, since it's hidden, I mean, people see the prices going up, which they usually don't like. They don't see the government printing more money or creating more money through the banking system. What they see is the, is the uh, actual price. They don't like it, usually. I said, my, damn it, the retailer just increased the price by 30% today. So the retailer is blamed or wholesale or unions or monopolists or, or speculators or aliens or whatever. And the government, of course, is leading the pack saying, it's a terrible thing. People are doing bad things. They're inflating. They're raising prices. It's due to consumers, excessive greed, uh, unions, speculators, businessmen. It doesn't make any difference. Whoever is disliked, except the government itself. Of course, the government itself is pristine. They're, they're running the ramparts against inflation. And... Uh, and, the, and the, of course, the answer is give them more power to, to stabilize the system. Uh, <laughs> but they are the inflators. As they're saying this, is they're charging everybody else with inflation down there in the basement of the Federal <laughs> Reserve building. They're printing more money. They're creating more money all the time. They're buying this. In, in, in tech, technical terms, they're buying more assets. And they're by creating more money. <clears throat> so the... Um, so what happens is we have, unfortunately, the, the hangover of the, through, through this momentum of uh, dollars now being accepted as, as money or francs or marks. And uh, in order to, to, de to privatize the, the, the zitter autumn, that is to privatize the money systems. How do we do it? How do we go about it? And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, one, of the ways, one of the things that has to be done is, as I said before, is to rescue the dollar, denationalize the dollar. And another thing is to... Is to Rescue gold. Most of the gold was sold away in Fort Knox, was confiscated in 1933 by the federal government, and it's still there. So we have a question of, of how to denationalize gold and denationalize the dollar and also tie the two together. And you might ask the question, why gold? Uh, one reason I, I, we've been accused, us, the pro gold Austrians have been accused of being constructivists, of, of being, uh, uh, not letting the market rip, not letting it work. Uh, of imposing gold on the rest of the system. Actually, first of all, gold is always won out of the, in the free competition against everything else, sand, bricks, ducats, Rothbard tickets, whatever. Uh, and second of all, it was gold. I mean, the dollar was gold until 1933. It's not sort of pulling it out of thin air. And uh, so what I advocate is redefining gold, a dollar as part of as a weight of gold and then getting it out of the Fed. In other words, abolishing the Fed, making it disgorge all of its assets and exchanging the gold for Federal Reserve notes and or possibly a demand deposits we'll get to later. <clears throat> but the, um, that would be the thing that can be done, but not only have I not, have I not been able to convince the world of this or the economics profession or whatever, but I haven't been able to convince the Austrian movement yet. So it's a long road to hoe <laughs> uh, on, this, on this particular position. The problem of letting the market rip is that they, the government's got the dollar. The government's already nationalized the dollar. The government's already nationalized gold. So you can't say let the market work from point zero because they've got the stuff there. Got, in other words, this is part, by way, of a whole general problem, which Walter will deal with later. Privatization. The problem of privatization is not just should we have private garbage contracts instead of the government. It's much deeper than that. 
We have the government owning a lot of stuff, and Russia it owns almost everything. Here it owns a lot. How do we get rid of, how do we denationalize government assets? It's not that simple. You can't say, let the market rip. How do we make it rip? Uh, what do we do? Do we homestead it? It's kind of a charming idea. Uh, <laughs> But I mean, some, some people say sell, sell the property for auction, but by what right does the government have to have the money from auction? Why do they get the, how do they get the right to the receipts? If government, if government property is illegitimate, as I contend it is, why should they keep the money from the auction? Why can't, why didn't just, why didn't just, why didn't just homestead it? Now they're different, I have no particular solution, you know, basic all over solution to this. My gripe is, there've been for the last 40 years, Dozens, literally dozens of free market institutes, free market foundations, and all that sort of stuff. And as far as I know, nobody's dealt with this question. Maybe one or two small articles somewhere. Nobody's dealt with a systematic question. How do we de-statize? How do we de-communize? Supposing, supposing Gorbachev's successor gives up. He reads Mises and he says, I quit. Okay? <laughs> and he turns over the keys to communism to the United States. What do we do with it? How do we decommunize? None of these anti-communist theoreticians have ever mentioned, ever talked about this topic. You know, stop talking for at least one minute about the evils of, of Stalin, et cetera. Start talking about how do we decommunize if we have the chance? What do we do? And one of the things on the gold question to do, it seems to me, is to get the dollar and the government gold out of the government out of the government's mitts. Because if we start a free market and money with letting, allowing the government to re retain the dollar, we worry the dice are loaded against us. We can print as many high X as we want. It doesn't make any difference. Because they've got the gold, they've got the dollar, which is the major money uh, in the country. I guess I've ranted on until it's, it's, it's five o'clock. So I guess I'll deal with banking tomorrow. I'll deal with both fractional reserve and central banking tomorrow. Thank you.